Hey everyone and welcome to this video and uh, today we're going to make paint. So get ready because it's going to be awesome. <laughs> Actually it's going to be a lot of work and you're probably going to be like I hate making paint. I never want to do this again. <laughs> but if you're like me you have specific colors that you may want to use specifically the yellow that I make. Uh, that's non-toxic. You want strong yellows that aren't cadmiums and you want to be able to sand your paint and things like that. Or maybe you just want beautiful non-yellowing fast drying paint and uh, you want to immerse yourself in the craft of making it yourself. So that's what we're going to learn about today. So basically um, let's just go over the supplies first and then we'll get into the process. So uh, I would highly recommend a copy of this book. Okay. This is the artist handbook of materials and techniques. Um, you'll find a lot of valuable information here in here about, uh, paint making and about many other aspects of oil painting, but, um, we'll get to, uh, the parts of this book or the specifically the part of this book that we're going to utilize, um, for this, uh, paint making process. Um, and I'll go over that in just a second. But um, other than that, you'll want um, your paint. This is just pure pigment. This is cobalt blue. And uh, this is Kremer Pigments Cobalt Blue, which we're going to make today. And the product number is 45701. And um, you can find uh, all the product information below this video as well. Um, we're also going to be utilizing um, linseed oil and and this is, uh, so this linseed oil is actually uh, linseed oil that I washed um, with uh, salt and sand and water according to the recipe of Tad Spurgeon. So you can find his website and linseed oil washing information also in the links below this video. And this is the type of linseed oil that I'm using today. Uh, this is cold pressed Swedish linseed oil. It's organic. Um, and raw. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's really good linseed oil, but if you just use this to make the paint, it's going to make the, it's going to make paint that will dry extremely slowly. And because it's raw and cold pressed, it has lots of unfiltered linseed oil components in it that will cause more yellowing over time. So this Tad Spurgeon, uh, linseed oil washing process removes those impurities of the linseed oil. And it also, uh, so that it will not yellow over time. And also it creates a faster drying linseed oil without adding anything to it. Um, the salt and the sand and the water that you use to wash the linseed oil doesn't add or leave anything in there. It only binds to and removes impurities. And, um, there may be something about its contact with those elements that, uh, speeds up the drying process as well. Cause that is the end result. So, uh, again, um, that's what I have here. So I've already done this process. That is an involved, um, multi-step process. Um, again, all the information is below this video on that. If you want to delve into that, but alternatively, you could also just get a good refined linseed oil to make your paint with. Now, this is Michael Harding's refined linseed oil. Uh, it's an excellent product. And I know for a fact that he's actually spent time with Tad Spurgeon and they tested his linseed oil and they found that his, the way that it's re the refining process that they use for his linseed oil uh, is just as good. It removes those impurities. I know that it's, it's not this traditional hand washing method, um, because this, the, the result is not a fast drying linseed oil. This is not a fast drying linseed oil. Okay. But it, it will dry without yellowing at all. So it's a good alternative. So you can use that. The other thing that you're going to need is this, this is linseed oil and beeswax. It's a linseed oil beeswax emulsion that I created according to the recipe. <coughs> in this book. Okay. So, um, the reason that we need, uh, a beeswax emulsion is because when you mix raw pigment with linseed oil, you get, um, you don't get a, you don't always get just like perfect paint, right? And linseed oil has a tendency to separate from the pigment. So you don't want, either of those things. You don't want, um, 
the pigment to separate from the linseed oil over time in your tubes when you're storing it. And you want to have some degree of influence over the consistency of paint, right? Because what you'll find is that every single pigment when it's mixed with linseed oil has different properties, right? Some are going to have a really nice buttery quality, which is most what most people want when they're making paint. Um, but some of the time it's like really stringy and sometimes like it doesn't blend well. So um, this is why a lot of paint manufacturers at, use additives, right? Things that they will add to the paint that doesn't actually impact the color very much, but impacts the consistency and also stabilizes the mixture so it doesn't separate in the tube. Now, um, the only, um, the only paint menu, I don't, okay. So I've talked to, to, um, Michael Harding via email and Michael Harding's wife actually. And they, uh, I, I was asking them like, can you give me any tips when it comes to, you know, making paint? Um, and they said, Hey, sorry, but <laughs> every paint manufacturer basically has their own, um, formulas and their own mixtures that they utilize so we can't tell you the proportions of how much pigment to how much linseed oil to how much of other stuff that we put in there um, that's up to you to figure out if you want to make your own paint but they did tell me that the only thing that goes into his paint is the pigment the linseed oil and beeswax so I took it upon myself to do the research and figure out, well, how does that work? And so the short of the long of it is beeswax is the most traditional that I know of um, additive that doesn't impact the color that will give you a nicer, more buttery consistency of paint and also stabilize it in the tube. So that's what we're going to use um, because I don't think that there's a better option that I know of. Um, so there's all that. <laughs> So the other thing that you will want is um, chalk. Now this is chalk from Champagne. This is 58000 on the Kremer Pigments website. Now I don't always use chalk, um, but for some of the colors that I've made, a small amount of chalk can help with the consistency. Now I know I said we don't add anything other than linseed oil, beeswax, and pigment but sometimes with sub, some pigments, because they have very sticky or stringy properties, um, that can really help just to alleviate some of that and make an, really a very small amount. So, um, but I like to have it on hand because the first time that you make any color, you're gonna have to figure out what is the ratio between pigment, linseed oil, and your linseed oil beeswax emulsion, uh, which we'll go over the making of, um, and possibly some chalk, a little bit of chalk. There are other things that you can get if you run into a problematic pigment like aluminum stearate um, and some other things. You can look on Kremer Pigments website or talk to the people there. They have um, some other inert, which means it doesn't influence the color at all um, of the paint, but will help to stabilize it or give you different consistencies. But honestly, you're probably not going to need that. All the colors that I've made, I have, I feel like I have plenty of, I, I have what I need to make the kind of paint that I want. Okay. So, uh, you'll also want a glass or marble slab like this to do your work on. Uh, this is from a marble stone company. Literally, I just, you know, went down the road. I found one of those places where they cut it, cut marble for cabinets and things, or not cabinets, but kitchens, things like that. And you can just say, hey, I want a chunk that's like a foot and a half by a foot and a half or whatever. And they'll just give it to you because it's just scrap to them. They're, they're, it's trash. They'll throw it away. So, um, so you can get that and it's very there these are very heavy so sometimes people prefer glass i mean this thing is really really heavy but i like it i like working on it it gives me some stability as well because you're going to like be grinding and you know scraping and moving things around a lot so you'll also want a glass muller 
Um, you can get this on the Kremer Pigments website. You can get it elsewhere, I'm sure, as well. Um, this is a nice, good size, I feel like, because it gets, it's a nice weight and um, a nice size for holding in your hand, uh, whether like this or like this, however you decide to use it. Um, that's a nice product. And uh, palette knives. You'll want some palette knives for scraping, um, and you'll want teaspoon or half teaspoon uh, measures. Uh, I, I usually, this is kind of how I measure everything, right? When I'm figuring out my mixture is I take a scoop of pigment and, you know, like level it so that it's exact <laughs> and put it in. And then I'll use, um, you know, a similar uh, teaspoon measure or whatever for my liquid. So I'm literally just doing everything by volume, parts by volume to find my mixture. You want to have some Gamsol on hand for cleanup. Um, and then one of the most important things that you will want to have is this, right? Which is just a little notebook and a pen. Because as you go, you want to, what I like to do is I write out like pigment and then oil, linseed oil, and then emulsion, right? So I have these three different things for the most part that I'm going to be utilizing to make the paint. And every time I add a teaspoon of each one of those things, I make a little check mark, you know, one, two, three, four, and then cross slash for five, right? And I'll do that um, in on each one of those things to keep track literally of exactly how much I've put in of everything. Because what you want ultimately is at the at the end of making your paint is to be able to tally all those things up and and uh, and know um, what your formula is so that next time you don't have to like go through the whole process of like figuring it out. You can just be like, oh, it's 11 parts pigment to three parts linseed oil to one part beeswax linseed oil emulsion. Um, that's my recipe for uh, Bristol yellow, by the way. So um, I haven't made cobalt blue too many times. So today we are going to go through that process and I'm actually going to figure it out as I go and I can give you a formula at the end. But um, that way you can get a, get a better sense of, you know, exactly how it how it looks when literally you're just trying to figure it out. Okay, so let's go over a general principle, which is when you're making paint, you want less, you don't you don't want too much linseed oil in the sense that your the paint that you make will have a stronger um, paint film, form a stronger paint film if it has less linseed oil in it by volume. Like, not it's not less, but basically as little as you have to use to make the consistency of paint that you want to make which means you don't want runny paint, right? You, you ultimately, you want to make a paint that has a nice um, consistency that can stand up, that can create impasto, um, but that also flows nicely in your brush. And you'll see as you go that if you pack too much pigment, it starts to get dry and it won't handle as well with a brush. But then if you go too much, it's like watery and or, you know oily and runny. So you want to find that nice balance, but generally less oil equals stronger paint, better paint. So that's the idea. So <laughs> before we actually get into making the paint, I want to go over the beeswax linseed oil emulsion with you because it's kind of, it's part of the process. It's important. And um, there's a few different aspects of it that are relatively important. So let's talk about that now. Okay. So, um, the beeswax oil, linseed oil emulsion is basically made up of two parts. It's made up of linseed oil and these beeswax pellets. So you want to get a good refined linseed oil, or you can use your washed linseed oil that you've done with Tad Spurgeon's recipe. Um, and you want to get uh, these little beeswax pellets, right? And so you can get these on the Kremer website. You want to get the bleached ones that are, that they have more of a whitish color, right? The, the unbleached ones are like really golden yellow, right? And they're going to impart their color to the paint. So um, again, probably not a lot, but we want 
pure color, as close to pure color as possible, which is why I like washing my linseed oil with Tad Spurgeon's method because I know that like how I see it when I'm making it is how it's going to look as long as it exists for the most part, right? Or as close as possible, as close as I can come to that. So um, the way to make this beeswax emulsion is listed in this book on page 188, okay? And let me just turn to that section and tell you uh, that the, because there's different editions of this book, many different editions, so it might not be on page 188 or I guess page 187, um, but it's the section in um, on oil painting and it's called hand grinding of oil colors and it lists the process of making the beeswax. And um, um, I can copy and paste the paragraph from here on below the video too if you want, um, but I honestly, I would just get this book because it's, it's really good for many other reasons. Um, but essentially, all you have to do is get a little measuring cup, right? Pour four fluid ounces of linseed oil into this measuring cup, and then you take your beeswax pellets and you add them to the linseed oil. You would just like, you know, tap, 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 like add some of these to the linseed oil. And you want to add enough of these little beeswax pellets to bring it to four and a half fluid ounces, right? Because the beeswax pellets are going to displace the linseed oil. They'll, they fall into it and, um, you know, increase the volume. So you want to go from four ounces of fluid on here to four and a half. So it's good to have something like this OXO uh, measuring cup has that little display where you can like see the volume from above, right? And um, and it's actually, it, it, it shows you really nicely, I think, because this doesn't even display exactly four and a half ounces, but you, you want to be relatively precise. So um, by having that view from above, um, you know, display, you can actually get like a, a really nice uh, approximation of what, of when it goes from, four, but when it's between four ounces and five ounces, you can really see, oh, okay, it's right at four and a half ounces, right? So then you have linseed oil <laughs> and beeswax, um, these beeswax pellets, and they're just going to be sitting in there essentially. And then you want to pour it into, um, they say like a tin can, or you can use uh, like any uh, metal, uh, you could even use like a small saucepan or whatever. Obviously, if you use it for that, you probably don't want to use it for food stuff afterward. And then you put it on the stove and you gently heat the linseed oil that has the beeswax pellets in it. And you gently heat it gen very gently, very gently, very slowly on low temp and you bring it just to the point where the beeswax melts and then you take it off the heat and you want to make sure that you take it off obviously before it boils or like really like it shouldn't get any hotter than the minimum necessary to melt the beeswax and then you pour the beeswax and linseed oil mixture into a little mason jar like this and cover it and close it up and then let it cool down and it's ready to use. Now, the thing about this beeswax oil emulsion, which I'm just gonna to refer to as emulsion from here on out, um, the thing about this emulsion when you're making paint with it is that you don't wanna have too high a percentage of beeswax in the paint, right? Because linseed oil is the main binder that we're using. It, I mean, linseed oil, is, it's almost like a glue, right? Now, beeswax is, I mean, I would say it's its own kind of binder, right? Because we can make encaustic paintings, which is just wax and pigment, right? But in my estimation, the linseed oil is doing most of the heavy lifting here. And in this book, they, they basically give you a chart of like how much beeswax to how much linseed oil is good or safe to use or whatever. So as far as I know from reading this book, not the whole thing, <laughs> but reading parts of it, um, is the highest percentage of beeswax that you want in your paint is gonna be 
like 4% beeswax. Now, this emulsion is 11% beeswax. So what that means is that a, uh, <laughs> let me double check my book, a three to one ratio, three parts oil to one part emulsion is the highest percentage of emulsion that you want as a component of your paint, right? Now the pigment, the pigment part, like what percent, you know, what, uh, what's the ratio? This can be any, th th there is no like limit, right? You're just gonna literally use as much of the, of the linseed oil and the emulsion as you need to make the consistency of paint that you want. But while you're doing that, you wanna be very mindful that you don't use too much emulsion. It should always be three, like if you're gonna do it in tea teaspoons, right? Three teaspoons of linseed oil, so one teaspoon of emulsion is the highest percentage that you want, technically. You could do slightly more than that because that's gonna bring it to around 3.67% beeswax. So you can do like slightly more than that, but most of the recipes that I've done, I keep it in that range. And then if I need something else to stabilize the mixture or to change the consistency of the mixture, then I use the chalk, right? But you'll find and 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 you will be amazed, right? Like a lot of people will make their homemade paint with just linseed oil and pigment and they're mixing, mixing. And you can get like, I mean, that's all paint is. And when you make your own paint like this, you'll you'll be amazed. Like it's gonna be really nice. Like nice like the nicest brands of oil paint that you've bought because like you're basically making the most, the highest pigment concentration oil paint that you could make, right? Um, so, uh, but you will be amazed too that like when you add the emulsion to the mixture, how it changes the consistency and gives your paint just that little bit more body and gives it just that little bit more, a um, little bit nicer handling quality. So that is essentially like how you do it. I mean, that's that literally like, I've just it told you like, that's it, that's what you need and that's how it works. And every paint that you make, you will have to find your own recipe for. And the only rules are the rules that I've given you. Three parts oil to one part emulsion is the maximum amount of emulsion that you wanna use in your mixture to keep the beeswax percentage in the right zone. And at, you know, find your ratio of these, these to this that will give you that right consistency that you want. I can tell you right off the bat, you're gonna be amazed how much pigment you can pack into this oil. Like, it's amazing how absorbent it is. And um, so that's it. So that's that's really like it for materials and like explanation and all that. Um, and now I'm just gonna film the process of making the paint and you guys can maybe I'll like speed it up or whatever, but um, but basically you can see the process and we'll look at we'll look at what it's like in, in the end. Also, one thing I forgot or two things I forgot. You're also going to want empty tubes of um, tin tin tubes to put your paint in. Um, I have a few on hand. I'll show them to you uh, when I'm packing the paint in. And also, you're probably going to want a lot of paper towel because it gets everywhere. And also gloves. <laughs> so many things this is why people just buy paint okay so like seriously i have a bunch of pigment that i bought and you know if this makes incredible paint because it's like fast drying and it's non-yellowing like i'll keep using it you know because like i just i like really nice materials but honestly finding paint manufacturers that make the kind of paint that you want if you can find all the things that you need it really is like so much easier so um that being said here we go enjoy the show <laughs> good luck so the last thing that you're gonna need before we start here is probably i should have mentioned it before it might be the most important thing you need a respirator or uh n95 mask which you probably have. <laughs> so um, these ones from uh, 3M or this one from 3M is really good. Um, 
And uh, yeah, it's just really important because you don't want to breathe in any paint dust, any raw pigment dust, regardless of what the pigment is or how safe or not safe it is. So I'm going to be wearing this. You can't see me wearing it, but you know, <laughs> you, I'll, I'll let you use your imagination. So this is really good paint. Um, you can see that it retains its body, its shape, and yet it flows really nicely. So this particular color, this cobalt blue, this pigment, in my estimation, it's it's a rather heavy paint, um, which means that like I could pack more paint into this oil for sure. Like like I like I said um, previously. The ratio was 11 parts pigment to three parts oil to one part emulsion. And so um, I tried adding that extra um, one part of pigment, which would have brought it up to 12 parts pigment, three parts oil, one part emulsion. And it just got too he more heavy, more stiff, and slightly more stringy, right? And 
you saw me testing it with the brush just because I like to see like, okay, well, how does it feel when I, you know, when I dip the brush in here? Is it going to be like overly stiff? Is it going to be overly like heavy, resistant? Like how well is it going to handle basically? And so for me, this is like the maximum amount of like heaviness and stiffness that I would want in my paint. Um, and so basically, I think this is a good formula for this particular paint. I'm gonna pack it into a tube. I have, you can get these really cheap on Jerry's Artorama um, or wherever um, they have. I have, you know, small tubes and I have big tubes here. All, all that's required to do to pack it into a tube though is literally I'm just gonna be scooping it up and putting it in and then like tapping the tube like that to like get the paint to settle down in towards the, the tip. And you keep doing that. You literally just scoop it up with a palette knife. You put it in and you have to kind of like scrape the palette knife off right on the edge to get all the paint to come off of the palette knife and then keep tap, 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 tapping. And as you tap, um, it makes the, 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 the paint settle into the, the tube and gets all the air out, which is what you want. All right, so uh, one last thing, uh, when you're closing up the tubes, um, so you can see like basically it kind of looks like a mess, you know, it's got paint all over it. So literally I just, you know, take a paper towel and wipe it off. Like that. And then this is a very handy tool. Um, it's like paint, it's like a tube, tube ringer. <laughs> and, um, it works really well to help close the tube. And, um, this, this last part is kind of tricky. I have it filled up to like maybe 75%, which is almost like over full. Like I, it's better if you have a little bit less, um, and you have more space to actually like pinch this down. Uh, so, but what I do is I kind of like, I actually close it kind of where the paint is ending, like the paint's here, right? And I'm gonna start kind of closing this and pinching it off where the paint ends. Cause if you just like cl clamp this down at the tip and then push this way, you're gonna get air trapped in there, right? So you, you wanna get all the air out if you can. So I'm gonna pinch this down and then I'm gonna look inside and just see like how far up the paint is coming. Cause I wanna like flatten it out, but I obviously don't want the paint to just start coming out the butt of the tube, which if you overfill it is like highly likely. <laughs> so, um, so again, like you want to do this and then like kind of get basically like as much of the air out as you can and get it like kind of comfortably flattened. And then you're going to use the tube ringer to like clamp down on the tip here and then roll it. And you have to kind of like apply pressure here while you do it to keep it from, um, you know, to make sure that it's actually like doing what you want it to do, which is like close down the tube without sending a bunch of paint out the, out the end of it that's open right now. So, um, yeah. So if you did your job correctly, which I hope I have, that looks pretty clean and I wouldn't like overdo it. You want to do it to the point where you feel like, any of this excess air is out, but it's not so like, you're not pressurizing it so much that it's gonna like shoot out the tube <laughs> when you open it or that these and these sides aren't gonna start like breaking and letting paint out the side cause that can totally happen. Um, and then what I like to do is typically I'll just take a little bit of this like extra paint that's on the palette and paint it onto a piece of um, masking tape and put the masking tape like over around the tip so like I know what it is. So it looks like a store-bought tube or more like a store-bought tube. All right, so when it comes to cleanup, you have a big mess to clean. <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, oddly enough, one of the best ways to clean the, 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 this surface off and to clean all these final things is, um, well, first of all, you know, you're going to probably want to use Gamsol and paper towel, then, um, water and paper towel is actually the best way to get the, the get this surface actually clean which is really strange like it to, i don't even know why that works it doesn't even make sense because like you can't clean your brushes with just water but um but it it works and i read about it somewhere or watched a video or something about it at some point but that's the deal. So I would probably just, I'm just going to do dry paper towel, then probably um, paper towel with some Gamsol, and then probably just paper towel with water. And then when I clean the muller, I'll do the same thing. Paper, dry paper towel, Gamsol and paper towel, then water and paper towel. Then I'll probably use like soap and water, like, you know, regular soap and, and, and water with like a toothbrush and just make sure that I get in the texture um, of this, um, of the glass uh, and then that's you know pretty much it everything else is pretty straightforward but that is a really good and strange tip to use the water and paper towel very weird but very effective um, yeah so that's it <laughs> have fun